Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with our feature, Dr. Francis Kelsey, who died recently at the age of 101. To illustrate how the concept of a feminist hero is devalued today, they talk about Madonna or Miley Cyrus or someone like that. But 50 years ago, Dr. Francis Kelsey was a true feminist hero at a time when it was much harder to be one. And by any right, she should be one of the great names in 20th century American medicine. But she's little known today. She was born in Canada, but came to the United States to pursue a medical career. She went to the University of Chicago. By the way, she was the first PhD in pharmacology at the University of Chicago, but that's not what she's famous for. To tell her story, I'm going to read from an article that I wrote for the Chicago Tribune when she was nearing her 100th birthday about two years ago. In the late 1950s, German scientists developed a wonder drug for women that was supposed to alleviate the morning sickness, insomnia, and headaches of pregnancy. German studies touted the medication, thalidomide, as safe, and it was distributed widely throughout Europe. Thalidomide became an immediate international success, and there was a move to bring it quickly on the lucrative American market. That would have happened had it not been for one physician working for the Food and Drug Administration, a brave woman largely forgotten today named Dr. Frances Kelsey. She was suspicious of the haphazard European testing and resisted pressure for approval from the drug company as well as her superiors at the FDA. With only a month on the job at the time, her position at the FDA was already tenuous. However, with good science on her side, she stood fast against approval until further testing could prove thalidomide was safe to fetuses. In 1961, before American approval, her diligence was vindicated when the drug was shown to be linked to birth defects. Worldwide, more than 10,000 babies born of mothers who took thalidomide suffered missing or deformed arms and legs. Because thalidomide was never approved for use in the United States, fewer than 50 of those infants were born here. Single-handedly, Dr. Kelsey prevented a nationwide tragedy provided a model for effective government drug regulation, and changed the culture and mission of the FDA. Fifty years ago, in a 1962 White House ceremony, President John F. Kennedy awarded her the highest honor an American civilian can receive, the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service. She was only the second woman to receive the award and was hailed publicly by President Kennedy for her valor. After she retired, the FDA named an award in her honor, to celebrate courage and decision making. She is still alive today nearing her 100th birthday and should go down as one of the great female physicians and true heroes of 20th century American medicine. It's time to recall the heroism of the woman who saved the nation from a medical disaster a half century ago by paying attention to the importance of drug testing and oversight, Dr. Frances Kelsey. Now that's a feminist hero. You can't do much better than that. Before she died, Dr. Kelsey moved back to Canada. Ironically, she was awarded the Order of Canada, the second highest award for a Canadian, 24 hours before she died. And I have to wonder why the Canadians waited so long. Of course, they allowed thalidomide on the market. That's where the Americans who did get it got it from, for the most part. And in her later years before her death, I think Dr. Kelsey was ignored as much in Canada as she was in the United States. Here is a Globe and Mail report on Dr. Kelsey. She was pretty debilitated when she gave the interview portion of this, but I think you can still understand her and see that she was still sharp. Frances Kelsey is a Canadian heroine. A hundred-year-old is lauded in the United States, but few at home have ever heard of her. More than 50 years ago, she almost single-handedly averted disaster by refusing to approve thalidomide for use in the United States. My name now is Frances Oldham Kelsey. My, uh, I was born Francis Kathleen Oldham, and I uh, was born at home, 1914, July the 24th, and then about a week or so later, the war broke out, World War I. Kelsey grew up in Cobble Hill on Vancouver Island, about 50 kilometers northwest of Victoria. She went to high school at St. Margaret's in Victoria, where a teacher identified her talent in science and encouraged her to pursue it. She earned her undergraduate and master's degrees in pharmacology at McGill University, and in 1935, she applied to become a research assistant to a noted pharmacology researcher at the University of Chicago. She got the job, in part, because they thought Francis was a man. Kelsey completed her PhD there and joined the university faculty, and went on to complete a medical degree as well. In 1960, after marrying and raising two daughters, 
Kelsey was offered a job with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and she and her husband moved to Washington, D.C. Kelsey was almost immediately faced with a decision that would eventually prove to be a lifesaver for countless American families. She was assigned to review an application for thalidomide, an anti-nausea wonder drug. She grew concerned about the application almost right away. Information was presented as very sketchy. It was more of a form of a sort of endorsement. <laughs> Nothing to back it up, as it were. Kelsey withstood great pressure from the pharmaceutical company, William S. Merrill, which was keen to see the drug approved so they could get it on the market for Christmas. Kelsey would not be pushed. Representatives of the company actually thought I was crazy because it's such a popular drug in Europe and they were losing money by my beginningness. And so, and of course, a lot of people wanted it too and a lot was sort of smuggled in on that. So it was really bad. It wasn't so easy as they thought. Kelsey was celebrated in her adopted country for her vigilance. President John F. Kennedy awarded her the highest civilian award in the U.S. Meanwhile, in Canada, lack of such a staunch champion had dramatic consequences. It would be terrible if I had passed it. I'd have that all my life hanging over me. It was a terrible experience, but it did bring much better laws into effect. Well, before we close on Dr. Kelsey, I just want to include a snip from John Kennedy's August 1st, 1962 press conference to illustrate the full effect of what she did. The problem of tighter controls to prevent the distribution of dangerous drugs, such as thalidomide, is a matter of concern to the president at his news conference. He outlines the steps the government plans to take. The United States has the best and the most effective food and drug law of any country in the world. And the alert work of our Food and Drug Administration, and particularly Dr. Francis Kelsey, prevented this particular drug from being distributed commercially in this country. Nevertheless, the drug was given to many patients on an investigational basis. We are reviewing what steps can be taken administratively to make this stage in the future less dangerous. We have recommended a 25% increase in the Food and Drug Administration staff, the largest single increase in the agency history, and the full amount was voted today by the conferees of the Congress. I hope the members of Congress will adopt those more careful provisions contained in the administration bill introduced by Congressman Arn Harris of Arkansas in the House. The administration bill, for example, unlike the Senate Judiciary Bill, will allow for immediate removal from the market of a new drug where there is an immediate hazard to public health, which cannot be done now, and contains with it many other very essential safeguards, which I hope the Congress will act on this year. We're going to move on now to another doctor, Dr. Louis Sokoloff, who died recently at the age of 93. Dr. Sokoloff was a nice Jewish boy from South Philly, and he became the head of brain metabolism at the National Institutes of Mental Health, and he was the leading force behind the development of the PET scan for the brain. PET is an acronym for positive emission tomography. The test uses a radioactive tracer, in this case fluorodeoxyglucose, a metabolite of glucose, to test not only structural function in the brain, but metabolic function in the brain. That's why the PET scan is unique. The scan, which has been processed to color code, lights up when different areas of the brain use glucose at different rates. Other scans, like the MRI and the CT scan, merely look at anatomic structures in the brain. They don't look at metabolic activity. So the PET scan is useful for things like detecting tumors, which use glucose differently, and other metabolic activities that might be going on in the brain at different times. Here's a little more on the description of a PET scanner. A PET scan creates 3D images of the body. It does this by using radioactive tracers, which are usually administered to a patient through intravenous injection. The tracers are made up of carrier molecules that are tightly bonded to a radioactive atom called an isotope. The carrier molecule can interact with, or bind to, specific proteins or sugars in the body. The carrier molecule that will be used depends on what the doctor is looking for. If she suspects cancer or is monitoring a known cancer's growth, she may use FDG, a modified form of glucose, which gets absorbed by tissues. When tissues absorb a lot of glucose, it may indicate a cancerous tumor. The radiation from the tracers poses little danger to the patient since they quickly pass out of the body. 
The isotope produces small particles called positrons, which interact with surrounding electrons. This interaction results in the complete annihilation of both particles, releasing two photons that speed off in opposite directions. The detectors in the PET scanner measure these photons and use this information to create an image of the distribution of FDG in the body. Here's Dr. Sokolov to explain how we got interested in developing the PET scan. My interest in localization of functional activity in the nervous system uh, evolved from my earlier experiences working with Dr. Ketty on blood flow and metabolism of the whole brain. When I came to work with Dr. Ketty, although I had no specific research ideas, I had some questions in my mind. I was interested in a question I'm still interested in, uh, and that was, what happens to the brain chemistry uh, in association with the uh, different functional activities going on in the brain? Uh, in particular, be, uh, because of my experience in psychiatry, uh, I was sort of interested in what happens in the brain and, uh, ang and anxiety or panic attacks. The brain is a very heterogeneous organ, not only anatomically, but also uh, functionally. Different parts of the brain are reserved to subserve specific different functions. It's a part for addition, a part for motor activities, uh, for touch, pain, uh, so on. And so we thought what we need is a method that would allow us to measure what's going on in the conscious, behaving brain locally, individually, in each region. And preferably, since in many conditions we wanted to uh, study, we wouldn't know where to look in the brain. We'd like to have a method that would look at the whole brain all at once. So we, we wouldn't miss where to look. In 1981, Dr. Sokoloff won the Lasker Award, the most prestigious award in medicine. And in 1988, he and Dr. Ketty, that's Dr. Seymour Ketty, won the National Academy of Sciences Award in the Neurosciences. Well, I'm going to close tonight with Jack King, who died recently at the age of 84. My way of introduction of Jack King, I'm going to play this. I'm at 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engines running. We have a liftoff. Lift off on Apollo 11. That was the countdown for Apollo 11 in July of 1969. The first time man walked on the moon. And, of course, we've done the Neil Armstrong podcast. Jack King was the voice of Apollo, and he also worked in the Gemini and Mercury programs before that. He was the chief of public information and the public affairs officer for NASA. And he worked at the Kennedy Space Center and, of course, did the most famous countdown in spaceflight history. Here is a NASA spokesman on Jack King. This week inside KSC, we honor the legacy of Jack King who passed away June 11 at the age of 84. Known as the voice of Apollo, Jack made history on July 16, 1969, when he did the commentary for the countdown and liftoff of Apollo 11. Finally, we're ready to go to the moon, and President Kennedy had given the mandate, which shocked all of us back in 1961, I guess it was, saying we're going to go to the moon before the end of the decade. Jack's NASA career spanned all of the human space flights of NASA's first three programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. He left government service in 1977. Even after retiring from the United Space Alliance, Jack stayed involved with NASA as a volunteer. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. We're going to close with a countdown song tonight. A couple of weeks back, I slighted Manfred Mann and their lead singer, Paul Jones, when I used their song, Pretty Flamingo, as my close, but I didn't use their version. I used the version by the Everly Brothers. So tonight, our closing song is the countdown song, 54321. The Manfred Mann, or the Manfreds as they were known in England, provided for the British television show Ready, Steady, Go, which was sort of the British version of American Bandstand. They gained international fame a short time later with Do Wah Diddy. The theme is sung and the harmonica is played by their great lead singer, Paul Jones. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.